First, I, I wanted to, to thank, uh, thank you, Gérard, for the uh, kind invitation to present something at the workshop, and I'm happy that it's going forward virtually. Um, I, I also wanted to thank Paul-André uh, for his nice talk just before this, because he introduced a lot of concepts that, that should make this talk easier to understand. So, uh, as uh, Gérard just noted, I, the, the talk of the title of the talk was Untyped Linear Lambda Calculus in the Combinatorics of Three Valent Graphs. Uh, for the specialists uh, in the audience, I just wanted to um, to point, I just wanted to make clear that when I say three valent graph, what I really mean is three valent map. And I'm going to spend a little bit of giving in a little bit of introduction uh, to say what I mean by map. So, so I, I think that some people might be already familiar with this material, uh, but probably others aren't, and this way we're, we're all on the same page. So I'm going to give an introduction to what, what are maps, what, what do I mean when I say that, and also a little bit about the combinatorics of maps. So uh, maps are a classical object of study. Uh, they have many different equivalent definitions. One way to define them is topologically, so a map is a two-cell embedding of a graph into a surface. Uh, whenever I talk about surfaces in this talk, we're assuming that the surfaces are connected and oriented. So here's a, a picture of the, uh, the complete graph on four vertices embedded into the torus. That's the topological definition of, of a map. Um, there's also an algebraic definition where the idea is that you uh, you can assign labels to the half edges of the graph, and then you can represent everything, all the information about the graph and about its embedding up to isomorphism just by a collection of some pure mutations. So a map can be considered as just a, a representation, a, a set equipped with an action of this particular group that I, I wrote there. Um, but it, there's also a very simple combinatorial definition of a map, which basically it's just a connected graph equipped with a cyclic ordering of the half edges around each vertex. This, these are connected graphs because we're thinking again what our surfaces are connected. And so, uh, so, so this, is what, this is what a map is. Um, to make that definition uh, clear, uh, so what, when I talk about graphs versus maps, these are three different depictions of the same graph. Uh, the, the two on the left are isomorphic as maps, but the two on the right are not isomorphic as maps, even though they're isomorphic as, isomorphic as graphs. Uh, and the reason is because the, um, if you look at the cyclic ordering of the half edges around each vertex, uh, to go from the one in the middle to the one on the right, we have to, we, we have to Pass the vertex to make it cross through another edge, and that's going to change the, the cyclic ordering. So, um, some special kinds of maps that I'm going to talk about. So, a planar map is a map which is embedded on the sphere or on the plane. So, we can consider it as a graph which is drawn on the plane. Uh, a bridgeless map, as I said, all of the graphs are connected, but a bridgeless map is, is a one which, if you remove any edge, it remains connected. And then a three valent map is a map with the underlying graph, every vertex has degree three. <clears throat> so one of the reasons why maps have been studied for a long time is they're connected to the famous four color problem, now the four color theorem, which formally is a statement about maps. So it's the statement that every bridgeless planar map has a proper face for coloring. And there's a well-known reduction, which goes back to the 19th century to date, that, that this is equivalent to a statement about three valent maps, namely that every bridgeless planar three valent map has a proper edge three coloring. So now I want to say just a few words about map enumeration. So uh, the graph theorist Bill Tutt was the first to look at the enumeration of planar maps. And I just 
put a quote here, which is from his autobiography, Graph Theory as I Have Known It, where he talks about his motivation for, uh, for studying this problem, which was actually related to the four color theorem, which then was still open. <clears throat> and he says that it occurred to me that it might be possible to get results of interest in the theory of map colorings without actually solving the four color problem. For example, it might be possible to find the average number of colorings and vertices for plane and triangulations of a given size. And then explains that to do that first, you have to know how many triangulations you have, and then you determine the number of four color triangulations, and then you can divide a second number by the first to get an average. <clears throat> So Tutt wrote a series of papers in the 1960s uh, where he, he attacked this problem and actually managed to get a lot of results. And one of his insights was to consider rooted maps. And this is, this is an old idea from, from combinatorics that uh, often if you're, you're counting objects, it can be hard because they can have non-trivial symmetries. And if you, you don't want to double count, so one way to do that is to, to root your objects to get rid of any symmetries. And so what, it, what is a rooted map? It's just, you can, you can see it as a map with a little uh, vector sticking off of one vertex. That's the, the root. And you can show that if you consider these things up to root preserving isomorphism, then a rooted map has no non-trivial automorphisms. <clears throat> so, so as I said, he managed to, Tut managed to make a lot of progress. He got some surprisingly simple formulas for counting different families of planar maps and triangulations, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so here's just a screenshot from one of his papers where he gives a, a formula for the number of rooted maps with N edges. <clears throat> and uh, this is, this is a very well-developed field. So since Tut, uh, the study of map enumeration has become a very active subfield of combinatorics. I put a few links at the bottom of the slide, which you can go to for more. Uh, okay, so uh, that was a bit of background. Uh, please, during the talk, if you have questions, uh, you, can, you can ask them. I don't think I can see the chat window, but it's fine if you unmute yourself to ask questions. Now I want to talk about something different, uh, which is the lambda calculus and specifically the linear lambda calculus. So, so thanks again to, to Paul André Melias who gave a little bit of, of an introduction uh, in the previous talk. Um, I wanted to, to give you a little bit more of the history. So, so lambda calculus is a formal system that was, was introduced by Alonzo Church in uh, originally, in, he, he invented it in 1928, and he published the first paper about it in 1932. Uh, this, history that, this, this history that I'm telling you is from the source at the bottom by Cardoni and, and Hindley. Uh, so Church's original goal was to develop a foundation for logic uh, that does not use free variables. And he wanted to be uh, something which is more natural than the system of Russell and Whitehead, which had just come out a few uh, couple of decades earlier and, and set theory. Um, so he came up with a very beautiful system. The only problem was that it was inconsistent. This was discovered by his students, unfortunately. Um, but, but all was not lost because Church was able to separate uh, his original system into two pieces. And he extracted one which is nowadays called the untyped lambda calculus, which is purely about computation. And then he had another system, extracted another part, which was typed, like in uh, Russell and Whitehead's system. So a typed lambda calculus, which he used to talk about logic. And this was in the 30s and 40s. Since then, lambda calculus has become very important, especially in programming language theory and in proof theory and other areas. Now, <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to be talking mostly about the untyped lambda calculus. Uh, one of the nice properties of untyped lambda calculus is that you can define so-called fixed point combinators. Um, the first one was actually due to Alan Turing, who was another student of, of Church's. And 
so I'm not going to get into the formal definition. Uh, there is the idea uh, that lambda calculus is a, it, it, lambda calculus is a programming language based around uh, the idea that everything is a function. All terms represent functions in some sense, and a fixed point combinator, in a certain formal sense, given a term that represents a function, it finds a fixed point for that term. Uh, so I just wanted to show you the actual uh, combinator itself, um, which was originally found by Turing. And you don't have to memorize it, um, but I just wanted you to see the syntax of the lambda calculus. And I wanted to point out uh, here uh, that you can see that the variables x and y appear multiple times. I mean, so this term uh, is actually there's you know it's something. Uh, one second, let me see if I can get a little pointer to highlight. Okay. Can you see my mouse moving? Yes. Along the screen? You can, okay, good. Uh, so, <clears throat> right, so, so here you have these variables x. So x appears two times on this side, y also appears two times on this side, and then the same thing on the other side. Uh, so this is actually very important for the construction of fixed point combinators. Um, but I'm not going to dwell too much on that, on the, again, on what fixed point combinators are, because I'm actually going to be talking for the rest of the talk on a special subsystem of the lambda calculus, which is called the linear fragment. So a term is said to be linear if every vari variable occurs exactly once. So this is a very well-behaved subsystem of lambda calculus, and it's no longer Turing complete. I guess I, I didn't mention that, but, but that was one of the first results uh, about the lambda calculus, is that it's equivalent to, to other models of computation like Turing machines. And, and, and the proof of that involves the construction of these fixed-point combinators. So the linear subsystem of lambda calculus is no longer Turing complete. It, it actually turns out to be complete for polynomial time. So I, I do want to try to convey to you the actual formal definition of the lambda calculus for the linear case. So I'm going to present it using this logical notation, which, which was also in Paul Andre's talk from, uh, this morning. So I'm going to define a uh, so-called judgment, which is going to say that the term t is a linear term with three variables x1 through xn. So this thing here is, is is a judgment. So we're going to be defining inductively the linear terms with a given list of free variables. And it's defined as inductively uh, like so, what in the bottom. So you have a ver variables are, are terms. And so a variable just has itself as a free variable. So that's what we, we show here, x uh, entails x. Now you have this rule for application so here t is a term, u is a term, and then t applied to u as a term. And intuitively, if we think of uh, t as a function, the t applied to u is supposed to represent the function t applied to the value u. But also t has some free variables, and now I'm using Greek letters to range over lists of free variables. So if it has some list of free variables gamma, u has some list of free variables delta, then the combined application t applied to u has lists, list of free variables gamma concatenated with delta because we're combining all of the free variables that occur in t and in u. And, um, and each free variable occurs exactly once because that's the linear restriction. Um, then there's one more interesting rule, which is the so-called rule of abstraction and uh, here it says that if t is a term with free variables gamma together with some distinguished free variable x, then we can abstract in the variable x to form a term which is called lambda x dot t. And now it has, it, it no longer has x as a free variable. So now x is said to be bound inside this expression lambda x dot t. Accidentally click there. 
And, and this, again, intuitively, is the idea of we're def now we're defining a function. So lambda x dot t represents a function which for any input x will return t. That's the intuition here. Um, finally, there's another rule which is sometimes called a structural rule. And, and basically what this is saying is that we don't care about the order of the, the variables, the free variables inside of the context. So uh, if t has some free variables, gamma, x, y, delta, we can permute, we can freely permute those in order to, to derive linear terms. Uh, so this, if you were uh, watching carefully in Paul and I's talk, this rule appeared there. Uh, there were also a couple, two other rules, which were called weakening and contraction. And weakening is, is basically, is the ability to say that a variable doesn't have to occur in your term. So you can throw away variables that are free. And contraction says that you can reuse a variable multiple times. And those, those rules are present in the full uh, lambda calculus, but in the linear lambda calculus, we don't have any structural rules except for this one rule of exchange. Um, now, I, I just put some terms at the bottom to remind myself to define them. And again, feel free to interrupt me with questions. So a subterm uh, of a term is this is just the standard definition. It's it's any term that appears inside the, if you think of the term as a tree, it appears as a subtree. Uh, so uh, for an application T applied to U, T and U are both subterms of T applied to U, as are any of the subterms of T and or U. <clears throat> and in this ex in the expression lambda x dot T, uh, T is a subterm of t and also the, the free variable x is going to be a subterm since it has to appear somewhere since this is a linear term. Um, <clears throat> alpha equivalence just this is a technical term from linear from lambda calculus which just says that we don't care about the labels of variables so we can freely rename variables. <clears throat> and a, a term is said to be closed if it has no free variables. So I'll give you some examples on the next slide. Uh, but like the, for example, lambda x dot x is a closed term since it has no free variables. It has one variable x, but that's bound by, by the lambda. And then one more thing I wanted to define. So as I said, in the linear lambda calculus, there's only one structural rule, which is called the rule of exchange. But you can even consider dropping that rule so that you, you only have the three rules at the top. Then uh, your, you, you consider your free variables as really as a list of free variables that occur in a certain order. Um, and if you do that, then you get a further restriction of linear lambda calculus, which is called ordered linear lambda calculus, um, which, is, which is even more restrictive. So to give you some examples of lambda terms and, and, and the syntax, so, so here's an expression, lambda x dot lambda y dot lambda z, x applied to y applied to z. Here I'm using the convention, so sometimes implicitly there's applications. So this is y applied to z, even though I didn't write parentheses. Um, so this is just an example of a term. It's actually an ordered term. Um, because we can derive this without using that exchange rule. And you can see that, that you know, the, why do we call them order? The variables occur basically in the order that they're bound by the lambdas. Uh, this is an example of a non-ordered term. Uh, so lambda x, lambda y, lambda z, x applied to z, that thing applied to y. And if we want to derive this term, then we need that exchange rule. I put these letters B and C next to them because these are actually uh, very special uh, terms uh, which are, which are uh, known in, in logic as the B and the C combinators, and they'll come back later on. Now, this is an example of a term which is not closed. So, th it's, and so the opposite of closed is open. It has, it has one free variable, which is x. So the term here is lambda y lambda z, x applied to y applied to z, and it has a free variable x, so it's not closed. Here, this is another example of an open term. So x applied to lambda yy is itself open because it has the free variable x, but it has a closed subterm, which is namely lambda y dot y. 
Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this was also mentioned in the previous talk. So lambda calculus, part of the reason why it's interesting is because you can do computation with it and, and computation all happens through this rule, so-called beta reduction, which uh, explains the, the interpretation of the lambda as defining a function. So what the way to read this is that if we have a lambda x dot t term applied to another term u, then this will reduce by the rule of beta reduction to t where we've substituted u for the variable x. This is the only rule uh, of computation in lambda calculus. And you can apply this anywhere to, you know, whenever you have a, a subterm, which is of this form, you can apply the beta reduction rule. This gives you a rewriting system on lambda terms, uh, which is confluent. So it doesn't matter in what order, order you apply it. And for linear lambda calculus, it's, it's strongly normalizing. So you always reduce to a unique normal, beta normal form. And sometimes this rule is also considered together with a rule which is called eta expansion. And this takes a term t and, and rewrites it to lambda x, t applied to x, which you can think of as a kind of extensionality principle. If t is a function, we can treat it as the function which given in argument x will apply t to x. And here's just a little example of that. Uh, so we have an expression, this big expression, which is actually the B combinator applied to lambda A dot A applied to T. We apply, here this is, we, we apply a beta reduction to this piece. So we substitute lambda A dot A for the variable X. And then we get what's here. Here we actually have a choice of which beta, uh, which subterm to apply beta reduction to, but we'll apply it inside here to lambda a dot a applied to y applied to z, and we just get lambda y lambda z applied to yz applied to t, and one after one more beta reduction we get to lambda z t applied to z. Um, and if you apply the eta rule in reverse, you can go down to t. So, um, so sometimes people talk about beta eta equality, which is the the notion of equality that you get by quotienting modulo beta reduction and eta expansion. So I want to say one more thing, um, which is which is about this uh, typed lambda calculus, and this is more connecting to to things that that Paul Andre Melias said in his talk. Um, so um, there's types are formed in in uh, in lambda calculus. There's very basic form of types. So types can either be atomic, and that's written x and y, or they can be uh, they can be function types. Or if we're thinking logically, these are implication types. And I'm using the notation for the implication, which comes from so-called linear logic. But you just read this as an arrow or as an implication. And now the judgment form it, it refines the, the the judgment form that we had before for untyped untyped on the calculus. Now we, as, we assign types to all of the variables and to the term. And the way that you read this is that T is a proof of B under assumptions A1 through AN, if you think of these as, as logical propositions. Because this is linear lambda calculus, uh, these, these hypotheses have to be used in a linear way. So now uh, you can define, again, you can define inductively a type system for linear lambda calculus. And it's just refining the rules that we had before. So, so here now, for the variable case, if we assume that x, you know, if we assume that x has type A, then x has type A. The application case, if T has type A arrow B and U has type A, then the application T applied to U has type B. And again, we, we keep all of the assumptions gamma and delta, we combine them into assumptions gamma, comma, delta. And then the rule for abstraction um, says that lambda x dot t, again, we think of it as defining a function. So now we're going to give it a function type, a arrow b, where we assume now that the variable, we give it the type, we, the variable x, we give it type a, and then we, we need to show that, that the term t has type b. And we still have the, the rule of exchange. Uh, so connection to category theory, you can see Typed 
linear lambda terms modulo beta eta equality as a presentation of the free symmetric closed multi-category over a set of atomic types. That's one of the reasons why, uh, why linear lambda calculus is interesting. And yes, yeah, so again, the, the free symmetric closed multi-category uh, and what by, if you're not familiar with multi-categories, this is, this is a, uh, a slight generalization of, um, of monoidal categories. And uh, so you can extend the, the linear lambda calculus to get a very similar presentation of the free symmetric monoidal, monoidal closed category over a given set. Okay, so that was, that was a crash course in uh, lambda calculus and linear lambda calculus. And now I'm going to move on to something else. So do people have questions about, about this? Is there, any, is there anything that you'd like me to spend more time on? I if think not, there is none. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Then, then if not, I want to go on to, you know, what on earth do these two things have in common? I started by talking about maps and map enumeration, then I moved on to, to lambda calculus. Uh, so several years ago, back in 2014, I thought that it could be interesting to count untyped, um, untyped linear terms, specifically closed beta normal ordered linear terms uh, to enumerate all of them by size, where the size you could just take to be the number of, of lambdas appearing. And there were some reasons uh, I was interested in this, which actually had to do with some joint work with, with Paul and Jamal, yes. Uh, but that's not important for this talk. Um, if you go back to the definition that I gave you of what are ordered linear lambda terms um, and, and what is beta normal terms, it's actually not very hard to come up with a recurrence that will uh, recount such terms by size together with a second variable, which is the number of free variables. You can get a recurrence and then you can, you can start counting these things. Um, it's also maybe more fun to just start listing them and, and see what sequence you get. So, so at size one, you have one such term, which is this lambda at x, x. At size two, you have two terms uh, where you read this as lambda x dot. Now this is x applied to lambda y, y. And the other term is lambda x, lambda y, x applied to y. <clears throat> this is at size two. Then at size three, you actually have nine terms. At size four, you have 54 terms. And you can keep going like this. So this is what I did. And I entered this sequence into the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. And it was surprised to me that it was there. Um, and it was listed as uh, counting something completely different and various things, but you can see there, there's a comment from Don Knuth that says that this is the number of rooted planar maps with n edges. If you look here, there's, a, there's a, actually a very simple formula, which if you remember, this is, this, it turns out that this is the formula which was computed by Tut in the 60s for the number of rooted maps, actually the rooted planar maps with n edges. <clears throat> So, so that's why I was in May 2014 very surprised about why you would get the sequence counting planar maps, where I started, you know, counting these objects. <clears throat> um, but I I got together with Alain Giorgetti, and we managed to find a bijection between this class of lambda terms and rooted planar maps. Um, I'm not going to be talking more about that bijection. Um, it's, it's a little bit, it's not, comp so it's, um, it's not so natural uh, for reasons that I don't want to get into now. Um, but, but what I, what I want to, to say is that it turned out that a couple of years earlier, um, another group of, uh, of Combinatorists, uh, French combinatorists, Olivier Bodini, Daniel Gardi, and Ali Jaco, they had found another connection, a similar connection between general linear lambda terms uh, and three valent maps of arbitrary genus. 
I'm going to be talking more about this in a moment. But, but now, if you look at these two connections, which were found uh, in similar times, so first there was the connection by Bodini, Gaudi, and Jaco between linear terms and prevalent maps, then the connection that we found between uh, beta normal ordered linear terms and rooted planar maps, not necessarily three valent. And you might think whether this is a piece of a larger puzzle. And well, it turns out that, that it is, and that there's actually uh, many connections between different natural subsystems of lambda calculus, actually subsystems of linear lambda calculus and different families of, uh, of rooted maps, both planar maps and, and maps of arbitrary genus. Uh, so, as I said, I'm going to be, so, okay, I want to point out a couple of things. So, so first, all of the connections on the upper half of the table between different families of, of linear terms and different families of three valent maps can all be explained as the restriction of a single natural bijection, which is the bijection originally found by Bodini, Gaudi, and Jaco, which I'm going to be exp explaining in a bit. The connections in the lower half of the table, uh, they're more mysterious. So, I mean, it might, it might seem a bit mysterious why in passing to beta normal terms, we suddenly go from three valent maps to general maps. And, and this thing is still, it, it is a mystery. It's still mysterious to me. Uh, we don't really have a good bijective explanation for the connections in the lower half of the table. On the other hand, uh, it's still been useful. The fact that these connections exist has been useful in finding um, connections between lambda calculus and, and some other areas uh, via their mutual connection to, to maps. I just wanted to point out one paper below, uh, which corresponds to, to the seventh entry of the table. Um, and this was actually a collaboration with, with Julien Cortiel and Karen Yeats, uh, where uh, we did some combinatorics and it had applications to uh, Karen Yeats's work in quantum field theory and it also had connections to lambda calculus. <clears throat> okay, I, I see that I, I put a note for myself at the bottom uh, to explain what unitless means. So I'm not going to go through this whole table, but I just want, I did want to mention, I already defined linear, I defined ordered. Unitless here means terms with no closed subterms. We talked about that before. So that's just what, what unit list means is that they have no closed subterms. And it turns out that the unit list restriction on lambda terms corresponds to the property of being bridgeless of, of a map. Okay, so um, in the most of the rest of the time, I wanted to explain this bijection between linear lambda terms and rooted three valent maps of arbitrary genus which, as I said, uh, this bijection restricts to explain all of these connections in the upper half of the table. So it restricts the one between order terms and planar trivalent maps, and between unitless terms and bridgeless trivalent maps. Mm -hmm. And again, this is uh, this bijection is originally from the paper by Bodini et al. And I wrote another paper a few years later where I was revisiting the bijection and, and, and explaining it from another perspective. Uh, so uh, there's actually an old idea uh, in lambda calculus, which goes back to the 70s at least, maybe maybe earlier, it's kind of folklore, which is that you can represent lambda terms as a kind of annotated graph. You can also, you can think of it as a, as a syntax tree where you have two kinds of nodes that stand for the two operations of application and abstraction where we're drawing the application with an at symbol and the abstraction with a lambda symbol. Uh, but then these trees are enriched with pointers coming from the lambda node to the corresponding occurrence of the variable that it binds. So this idea is, is especially natural for, for linear terms because you have just a unique occurrence. Every lambda has a corresponding unique occurrence of a variable. <clears throat> so. So if you, you know, if you see it as a tree with pointers, well, that corresponds to a kind of graph. Here I've, sh I've shown a picture. Uh, this is the representation of, of some, this is kind of an arbitrary term, lambda x, lambda y, x applied to lambda z, y applied to z. <clears throat> you can see this is a rooted graph. Uh, 
the root is annotated with the term itself, then the other edges of the the other edges of the graph correspond to subterms. So like this edge is annotated by the subterm lambda y x etc. This edge is annotated by the variable x, which you know you can also follow the wire to here, and you see that here we have a subterm which is annotated. You know the edge is annotated lambda z y applied to z, and here at the output of this application node, we have x applied to lambda z, y z. Okay, so, so that's this idea which of just a diagrammatic representation for, for lambda terms, which again is kind of folklore from the 70s. You can give some explanation for this uh, in the framework of, of string diagrams, which uh, Paul-André talked a lot about in the last talk. And this, this is related to an old idea of Dana Scott uh, for modeling the untyped lambda calculus. So I mentioned that typed lambda calculus, well, the linear typed lambda calculus has relation to symmetric closed multi-categories or uh, symmetric monoidal closed categories. And there's, there's a similar connection between typed nonlinear lambda calculus and Cartesian closed categories. Uh, but for the untyped lambda calculus, uh, a long, uh, a long-standing question was: What does it mean mathematically? Not just you know in terms of formally, in terms of rewriting, but is there is there a natural mathematical model uh, where you can really think of terms as functions? And the problem, kind of the paradox that Dana Scott observed, was that you you need, in a sense, you need to find a type u or you need to find a set u which is isomorphic to the set of functions on u the set of functions from u to u and you, you can't do that in set theory <clears throat> for cardinality reasons but but you can do it with other models uh, more more refined models so dennis scott came up with the first uh, first models and, and later he gave uh, an axiomatic um, explanation for that as this idea of a reflexive object in a Cartesian closed category. So an object U in a Cartesian closed category such that it's equipped with an isomorphism or maybe some retraction uh, to uh, the space U to the U. And you can do the same thing now where instead of Cartesian closed categories, you have symmetric monoidal closed categories. Um, and so then you have these two operations which now I'm writing as at and lambda suggestively because they, they correspond to the two operations of application and abstraction. And then if you use the, the formalism of, of, of string diagrams, you can, you can represent them this way. So I, I drew application over here. It has one incoming wire uh, at the top. I'm reading the diagrams from top to bottom. And that corresponds to the type U. And then at the bottom, um, it has two wires. One is an incoming wire, one is an outgoing wire. And you can think of this as U uh, arrow U. Um, more concretely, if you imagine working in a compact closed category, then U arrow U is could be represented as U tensor U star. And so then we're using the standard conventions for compact closed categories to represent this this operation. Uh, the lambda, the abstraction operation, is just is dual to that because it goes from u or u to u. If we think in a compact closed category, it has this type u tensor u star into u, which is then represented as a node of this type. Um, now, uh, if <clears throat> so, I wrote here now rules which correspond to beta reduction and eta expansion. If you're working in a, in a higher uh, category, you could see these as two cells. Um, otherwise, maybe you could see it as, as an equation. Uh, but, but diagrammatically, uh, it's, so diagrammatically, it's nice to observe that just that, that beta reduction, the, again, the, the rule of beta reduction says that lambda x dot t applied to u goes to t with u substituted for x can be read as this diagrammatic rule, which is kind of unzipping operation. You take two, these two nodes um, and you unwind them to get just a pair of edges. Eta expansion corresponds to this bubbling operation where you take a, a wire and you replace it, you insert these two nodes 
in this shape. Okay, so now that that we have this diagrammatic representation for for lambda terms, for and partic particularly for linear lambda terms, and we have some way of understanding it maybe categorically, it's it's not so hard to see how you go from linear lambda terms to rooted trivalent maps. The idea is well, you just you take the lambda term, you represent it diagrammatically as I've done here with some different examples. So like this is here, the, this is an example for the, the B combinator represented diagrammatically. This is an example for the C combinator. And well, what do you do? You just forget the, the colors and the orientations on the colors of the vertices and the orientations of the edges. And what do you have? You have a three valent graph, uh, which is rooted because there was the distinguished root. And, and it's, it really is a map rather than a graph because we care about the cyclic ordering. So these two three valent maps are not isomorphic because they have different ordering. Um, we can do this for closed terms, like I showed here. We can also do it for open terms, terms with free variables. But in that case, uh, so diagrammatically, you can think of the free variables as wires. So on, it's like inputs coming from the boundary, which are then flowing through the term and then going out into the root. And if we forget, uh, if, if, if we again we apply this forgetful transformation, then we get now a trivalent map. But now it's on a, it's a rooted trivalent map, but now on a surface with boundary with some edges attached to the boundary. Uh, so so I hope that's pretty clear. How you go from the linear term to a rooted trivalent map. What might not be clear is how do we go how do we go backwards? Um, how do we go from a trivalent map to a linear lambda term? Because what the existence of this bijection is saying is that in a sense this transformation is invertible. So given a rooted trivalent map, there's a unique linear lambda term that uh, maps down when you forget about the, the colors, when you forget about the distinguish between application and lambda and about the orientations of the wires, it maps down to that trivalent map. So, um, so here's an explanation for that. <clears throat> so first, as I said, we want to consider um, rather than just uh, rooted trivalent maps in the classical sense, we want to consider maps on, on surfaces with boundary that can have some uh, free edges attached to the boundary. They have one edge with, on the boundary that's marked as root. Then uh, we observe that any such map with boundary has to have one of the following forms. <clears throat> so again, this is a trivalent map, rooted trivalent map. We, look, we go to the root, and then we look at the, the vertex, which is adjacent, the three-valent vertex, which is adjacent to the root. So here I've gone to the root and then to the three-valent vertex, and I ask what happens when you remove the, that vertex. In this case, the map is split into two pieces that I'm calling T1 and T2. That's one possibility. Is when we remove the vertex adjacent to the root, it splits into two pieces. Another possibility is well, it, it stays connected. And in that case, so if it stays connected, we can reroute T1 canonically just by going to uh, going down the left here. I can reroute uh, T1, put the, move the root over here, and then put this edge, make it now be attached to the boundary. So there are these two possibilities. We, the, the vertex adjacent to the root is either uh, disconnecting or or not connect or connecting, um, or really there's a third possibility, which was actually there was no three valent vertex. This is kind of the degenerate three valent map, which just has one edge, which is you know, which is attached to the boundary, both at the root and on the other side. But now, if you look at this uh, this characterization of rooted three valent maps of arbitrary genus, well. This is exactly like the, the inductive definition that I showed you for linear lambda terms. These three cases of application, abstraction, and, very, and the variable case. And um, right, so, so once, uh, so, so that's the basic idea of the, the correspondence between, between rooted three valent maps and linear lambda terms. At least this is one way of understanding the bijection. And I'll just give you a little example to illustrate that. So here, this is a, 
uh, a rooted trivalent map, the, the Peterson, you know, rooted embedding of the Peterson graph. And you know, I claim that it corresponds to a unique linear lambda term. How do we compute it? Well, we go to the root, we look at the vertex adjacent to it, we ask what happens when we remove it. In this case, it's connecting. Therefore, um, this corresponds to a lambda. And, and if you remember, I'm drawing the, the lambda nodes or the abstraction nodes with in red. <clears throat> and then we continue, we go down the left side and we place the root here. We move the other edge, we move it onto the boundary and we do the same thing. So now we look at this vertex and when we remove it, it's connecting. So this corresponds to a lambda. We continue and we, we keep going along. Um, we, we keep going and you can see that all of these nodes are going to be uh, connecting nodes. So they're gonna to correspond to lambdas until we get to this point where now you can see that we have two edges here and when we remove this vertex, it's actually going to split into two pieces. I mean, there's this little piece, which is a trivial piece here, and then there's the rest of the graph here. So this is gonna correspond now to an application node rather than to an abstraction node, and we call it in, in blue. And then we can continue, et cetera, and we, we, we traverse the whole graph and finally, so finally we have the diagram of the term, which corresponds, you know, this is now the term in traditional syntax. So that's the linear term corresponding to this embedding of the Peterson graph. So uh, I think I'm pretty good on time. I, I wanted to say just a couple more things. So, so as I said, you know, we've found various connections between the combinatorics of lambda calculus and the combinatorics of, of maps, particularly three event maps, but also some connections to, to general maps. And uh, it's, I think it's just the beginning of a story that you know, we, still don't, we still don't really understand, but I think that there are deeper connections to be explored. So one is about typing. <clears throat> and there's, a, there's an analogy that can be made precise between typing a linear lambda term and coloring the edges of the corresponding, corresponding graph. So here I've recalled the typing rules that I showed earlier for linear lambda calculus. Now, um, I just wanna take the step of you know, supposing now that we, we interpret types less, uh, more, more concretely. So rather than you know, being just logical formulas or, or types of, function types, uh, we're going to interpret them in some concrete group. So given if we have any abelian group, we can interpret this connective A implies B, we can interpret as the operation B minus A in any abelian group. And now, just for the sake of argument, consider this in the group uh, Z2 times Z2, the, the Klein-4 group. And now I claim that if you take any ordered linear lambda term, uh, you can type it in this type system, where now you're drawing the types from this group, the Klein-4 group, under this interpretation of implication. Uh, you, can, you can type it uh, su such a, in such a way that any subterm u of t, <coughs> it will only be colored in, it will be given the, the zero type of the group just in case u is closed, that is, u has no free variables. So you know, the other way, if u has a free variable, then it will be given a non-zero a, a non type, a non-zero element of the Klein-4 group. Uh, so now I give you a challenge problem is to find a direct proof of this claim. And this is essentially, <clears throat> this is essentially all I wanted I wanted to tell you about. I just wanted to give you a few uh, pointers as well. Um, so, I, uh, as I said, kind of the story for how I originally oh. got interested in this was a kind of a, a experimental math in the spirit of experimental mathematics. And something I like about this is that it's it's easy to uh, to play with these lambda terms and, and generate them. And so I just gave some links here, which, uh, since the slides will be available, you, there's also you can click on the links. Um, so this tool, the Lambda Term Visualizer and Gallery, will let you 
put a lambda term and then go get the corresponding Rudy three valent map that corresponds to it. Uh, this tool, this interactive lambda maps toy, uh, does the converse. So it will let you draw a three valent map like on the left, and then it will automatically compute the linear lambda term and the, and the string diagram corresponding to it. Um, and then there's a, a library at the bottom, which lets you do some experiments like generating random linear lambda terms and, and running some experiments on them. Uh, so that's all. Thank you. And I'm happy to be answering questions. Thank you, dear Noam. Noam. Questions? Uh, Remarks I see a question comments? from. Yes. Did, did, did Carol raise his hand? Uh, he's speaking, but he's muted. Ah. Uh, can I? I would like to make a small comment. Do yes. you hear me? Yes. Gerard, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. I hear you perfectly. So, yes. Okay, so I would like to uh, come to the first part of your talk where you quoted some enumeration formulas uh, derived by uh, derived by Tata, and uh, uh, there are of course some other papers which are related with this chapter. Yes, exactly this kind of formulas, and in fact there is a connection between this type of formulas as well as formulas derived by Mireille Bousquet Melou later in a series of papers which are apparently very much connected to this lambda calculus. So these formulas uh, show that uh, the numbers like this formula which just appeared on the screen are in fact uh, moments, Hausdorff moments of positive functions. In this case, this is an nth Hausdorff moment of an elementary positive function on the positive segment 0, 12. And wow. the, um, other formulas uh, given by uh, Mireille uh, turn out to be also moments of, of rather more complicated functions. So my, my suspicion is that this whole zoo of formulas uh, emanating from this set of theories, they might be connected with the uh, positive, positively defined integer sequences. There, there is no proof. This is just an experimental, uh, experimental observation. And we have uh, published with my collaborator Wojciech Motkowski from Wrocław a series of papers which can be found uh, also by Sloan. Dear, dear Carol, just to make precise, is it Hausdorff or still just moment? In most cases, it is Hausdorff. Okay. So you said the references are on Sloan? Yeah, yes, in Sloan and also uh, you can find all these papers in archives. Uh, so, uh, in archives, and I, ca I can, of course, publish the reference list of these papers or uh, just uh, give you privately as you wish. Uh, they are available uh, and published. Uh, the, and my, my, uh, my suspicion is that this is not a, a just a coincidence, but it might be a rule. So, the, there is a, probably a, some connection with the positive definiteness. Okay, I have no proof of that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, of course, I'd be interested in the references. And there's, I mean, yes, so something that, that I like a lot is that this field of map enumeration has lots of connections to other areas. So something else that I'm interested in, I've been interested in uh, recently is this uh, work of of Olivier Bernardi, which is connecting planar map enumeration to uh, counting lattice walks, certain kinds of lattice walks, like um, I mean lattice walks in the upper half plane, and that's also a question about whether whether that has any connection to lambda calculus, and 
So that's that's a question that I'm interested in. Okay, other questions uh, or comments? So thank you so much, dear Noam.